Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Velasquez. Uh, very proud to be able to introduce uh, somebody from my home area out of Montrose, Colorado, an example of American entrepreneurship, creativity, and job creation. And I uh, want to welcome uh, Mr. Bill Patterson from Montrose, Colorado. He is the founder and chief engineer of TEI Rock Drills and is based in Montrose, Colorado. His company manufactures high-tech drilling equipment for the mining and construction industry and has 40 employees. He is also the holder individually of six patents relating to rock drilling and noise control. He received his master's degree in mechanical engineering from Ohio State University in 71, where he was summa cum laude, and in his current role, he oversees full operation of the company and leads their international sales division. Uh, thank you for being with us today, Bill, and appreciate you making the trip. Thank you, Scott, uh, and thank you, really, for this. It's, it's a unique opportunity for me. Uh, been here a long time ago, and, uh, but this is where the action happens, and this is where we need to make sure that, that we do things for small business. Let me start by telling my story. You kind of heard the background there, but I'm, I am a mechanical engineer, and I started a company that... Uh, in 1980, and uh, as with many entrepreneurs, I started the business after the company I served as chief engineer, Gardner Denver, was sold. And the machinery division of which I was working was essentially cashed out. Now, I left there figuring I'd never see another rock drill in my life except when I drove by it. But what I found is that the new company, Gardner Denver, couldn't produce. They laid off all their workers, and I basically went and found the workers that were laid off. They were the ones that knew how to produce parts, and I produced those parts for the clients, my clients that I knew, in, and basically became a pirate part manufacturer for Gardner Denver equipment. That's how I got started in business, and I thank Gardner Denver all the time for doing that. Uh, you know, as our sales grew, we became a family business. I brought my sons and daughter in. And in fact, my daughter is president of the company. And uh, we sell percussion and rotary rock drills. We're the last US manufacturer of percussion rock drills in the United States. Uh, Olden Company does still market the joy drill, but we're, we're actually the last one that actually produce rock drills. All the other companies have either been sold or basically have stopped production. And it's a good market. To increase jobs and sales, uh, we did expand into exporting some time ago. I worked with the local Colorado Department of uh, uh, Labor, uh, or ex international sales. And uh, we, we started marketing primarily in South America. The language was one that we understood, and that's rule number one. You got, if you're going to sell in any country, you have to be a part of that country. And uh, we became a leader in, our, in rock drilling equipment. Our primarily, we sell attachments to uh, construction equipment for limited access. Our current sales are over $8 million, of which about 40% typically a year is exported, primarily to Americas, North and South America, and Europe. We employ about 40 total workers, and we pay good wages in Montrose, Colorado. That's the nice part about manufacturing. Manufacturing tends to pay good wages. It's not a service industry. It is a producing industry. It is a value-added industry. And that's why I think it is so important. The benefits to the trade is job creation. Today, our brand is sold worldwide. We proudly put Made in America on every unit we sell because that really I mean, it, it is amazing. Even here, I just got back. I was down in Arizona, and we have uh, four units that are working on a solar generation plant down there. And those workers said, our stickers are falling off. Would you bring us more stickers? Because they're proud to be using a machine that's made in the United States. And it carries a quality connotation that we can also market in the rest of the world. But we need, if we're going to expand, we need to be able to sell worldwide. It is very difficult for a small company to do this. And that's where we need to help, because we need a level playing field to work with. 
and Congress is in the best position to do that. So the free trade agreements under consideration are vital for providing a level playing field. In particular, what we have found is that is uh, one of the major problems is transportation. How do you get your product to the other country, and how do you make that as seamless as possible? That was the primary advantage of the NAFTA agreement for uh, TEI rock drills, was that we could produce a product, we could put it on a truck, and we could ship it into Mexico and Canada without changing shippers. And you'd be amazed at, at how seamless it is today and how difficult it used to be. It, everything would stack up in Laredo. So we need these direct transportation opportunities. That is an aspect that is in most of these bills. The other aspect of international trade that we always run into is, is what I call the technical requirements. Typically, you look at trade agreements as leveling the playing field in terms of your, uh, what you have to pay. But even more so is making it that individual companies do not erect technical barriers to your sales. And this is also needs to be addressed. And we have found that we can address most of these. We work 9,000 ISO, 9,001, and all of these make it easier from a technical standpoint. And I see I'm almost out of time, so I'd better hurry up. Uh, but again, what we get in there, Japan in particular has unique technical requirements. And if we're going to export there, Korea is working with the United States, and, but that can be a lever to make Japan do the same thing. But tariffs are the bigger, biggest, largest barrier, but in particular, it's the value-added taxes that, that are, are used as a tariff barrier. And we get that in, in every country that we deal with. Uh, it's basically a sales tax. Not many people in the United States understand this, but it, it is as high in Brazil as 40%. So when we try and sell a product into Brazil, we get tacked on a value-added tax. And the final issue to be addressed worldwide trade is protection of intellectual property. We have patents. It is very difficult, very expensive for any company to protect their patents. We protect them very vigorously, but the problem is that you, know, you need more clout. And what can we do if they copy our product other than kind of say, gee, that's too bad and go, go on our way? We need some clout, and that's why it's important that these trade agreements have protection of intellectual property. In conclusion, I ask for you to re reduce the restriction, starting a uh, manufacturing business, because that's where good jobs are created. We need good value-added jobs. It takes a tremendous amount of money to, to do uh, required per job. We've, we estimate it costs half a million dollars in capital equipment for one good manufacturing job. Access to capital, and uh, we need uh, the expertise. You can use, you can get that expertise, but that needs to be advertised so people can understand that. And if I can say one thing, from a business standpoint, uncertainty is far more of a barrier than cost or others. We can overcome cost. We can be more efficient. But if we don't have a certainty with what we're going into as a business, it, it is the greatest barrier that we run into. <coughs> so I uh, thank you. I see I'm over time, but uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come here and speak to you. Thank you, Mr. Patterson.